you know, the appreciator is back. And uh, yeah, we're just rolling right along in this unending series, at least up to now. I mean, one day as it, I may end, but uh, for the time being, you're kind of stuck with me here. Uh, whether you're listening on the amazing Overnight Scape Underground, the home of genuine, bona fide tributes to night radio. Uh, that's what we do, and we do it better than anyone else. Don't let anybody fool you. Um, this time we are going to have all sorts of stuff um, it just talking. Uh, and we're going to have a Vic and Sade episode shortly. But I want to get things rolling by... Uh, thanking and recommending the latest episode of Fusebox, their 227th episode in an ongoing series. Blue Perfect Pocket is the title, in case you go looking and can't find it. And uh, it's just a great show. Um, Mark Rose takes you through his um, almost sunstroke experience at a blues festival. And, and I like the way they set up this blues festival. He tells more about it. But one of my pet peeves in going to any show, festival, musical show, with more than one performer is the waiting. Somebody finishes playing and it's like forever until the music starts again. They got it set up. This sounds great. The music stops on one stage, it immediately starts on the other, and they have a very good audio-visual setup where you don't miss a beat and you can see everything no matter where you are. More festivals like this, please. And uh, Buddy Guy, how can you go wrong with the jazz and blues jazz? The blues mastery of uh, one of our last living masters, Buddy Guy. I mean, I'm sort of a Johnny Winter fan, and he mentions Johnny. I mean, Johnny has a lot to do with why I have anything to do with contemporary blues. I mean, I'm an old-school bluesman in string band music and old-timey stuff, um, as you may be well aware with from other uh, encounters with Gret, the appreciator, a.k.a. PQ River. Uh, but... And... and Especially, I have to thank the Fusebox guys, Mark and Milton, everybody, for um, plugging and talking about our recent Appreciator episode that uh, Mark Rose so kindly produced and joined me for, where we paid a heartfelt tribute and retrospective on the man with the conceptual continuity of all conceptual continuities, Frank Zappa. Oh, do I miss Frank Zappa. If he were alive today, oh, it would just be... Number one, he would have enough material to write some more amazing and um, topical songs. But his whole body of work from his very first album on is still so essential and so musically innovative. And uh, it's food for your brain, both musically and and lyrically, uh, if the music on that particular album has lyrics, that is. And uh, as I've said, uh, and they just reinforced it, coming soon will be another episode in that series. We're going to talk about the Freak Out and Absolutely Free albums together. And if you have any thoughts on that, you should uh, get in touch with me and pitch in in some way. Because uh, while I'm sure... There aren't as many fans of Frank Zappa as the Beatles. And even the Beatles kind of petered out. But uh, Mark and I are pretty hardcore. And I bet you, over time, we are going to hit all the bases on the Frank Zappa ball field. And uh, it is our plan to hit all of the Canon albums. Not so much the oddball live box sets, the 25 record uh, collections, um, things like that. But uh, the main album library, and who knows, we may change our mind and just go for it all. That big bite of Zappa and Mothers of Invention magic. And um, it, it's all a love fest. And I, uh, well, I'll talk about that. Uh, the, the one thing you're going to want to absolutely catch in the Freak Out Absolutely Free 
is I did some research and I found out how my cousins who turned me on to Frank Zappa, the story of how, well, it's how Freak Out was discovered right when it came out back in 1966, leading to me being exposed to Frank Zappa at the ripe young age of six years old. Can you imagine? I mean, what little you know of Frank Zappa, a six-year-old, it, 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 the mind boggles and buckles. Um, let's see. I saw a Wes Anderson film. I really haven't seen much of his work. I've heard he's very stylized. I've heard people talk about him, but I got a chance to see his latest uh, production, Asteroid City, which it's one of these ensemble films with so many. I mean, I'm not even going to spoil the magic because I didn't really keep an eye on the credits. And it, as always, it took me forever to recognize Brian Cranston, who has a, a pr pretty decent role in it. Uh, to, just to digress for a second, um, I had a, I had no idea I've been watching Brian Cranston for years and years. Only today when I was looking him up did I find out he was the dad on Malcolm in the Middle years and years ago, which is probably, almost doubtless, the last situation comedy that I watched as it aired as a new program. And I only watched like the first season of it, and I know it ran for several. And uh, I did finally catch up with Breaking Bad, which as an appreciator, I have to tell you, uh, I avoided it. I thought, okay, it's New Mexico. I've kind of lived the life. And it, it was just too overpraised or something. So I, I skipped it and let it go by and never caught up with it until the last couple of years. And when I watched it, that is really, for my dollar and my time and effort, one of the greatest, best written, best acted, best assembled series in the history of of dramatic television. And I mean, it's got some funny parts, some ironic parts, and if you haven't seen it or have avoided it, uh, to just you get a hold of it. Take some time. I mean, if there's any series I could think of that I would recommend worth marathoning, uh, that's really on the top of the list. Now, this Asteroid City, I don't want to spoil it too much, but the basic plot line sets us in this imaginary mid to late 1950s scene and setup. And uh, the production of a play and a TV special contemporary with that on how the play was put together in that style and the style i did the film no it's not legendary it's not a great great film uh and to be honest i think it had potential to be a much greater film than it wound up but it was fun to watch i loved seeing all of the different actors and actresses that just sort of show up and play little bits and uh, bigger bits as the movie goes on. And, and I'm just a sucker for uh, this man's cinematography, set design, and the makeup. This was definitely an artistic vision, um, much like one of my favorite film directors, Peter Greenaway, who, of course, has his own very complicated artistic vision, and some of his films can be hit or miss, but they're worth seeing because it's just such a wonderful eyeful of style and, and gorgeous, gorgeous looking scenes and assemblage. Check it out. And uh, I think uh, we all need to smile again. So uh, let's check out the episode of Vic and Sade that I have picked out for our ears. Now get ready to smile again with radio's home folks, Chris Goes, Vic and Sade. Golly, time flies fast. Why, the second week in Crisco's final big double cash contest is almost over. 
Yep, and if you don't want to miss your opportunity of winning a small fortune, you'd better hurry with your entries. Remember, there are 126 big cash prizes waiting to be won. A $2,500 top prize, 25 prizes each $100, and 100 prizes each $10. And listen, you can double the amount of any prize you win by submitting your entries on official contest blanks available only to your Crisco dealers. Or, if your dealer happens to be out of those blanks, here's another way to double any prize you win. Write your entries on plain pieces of paper and have your dealer sign his name and address to each one. Either way will double the amount of any prize you win. It'll double that first prize of $2,500 to $5,000. And if you don't think it's a thrill to win $5,000 cash, just listen to what Miss Catherine Lord said when she won a Crisco contest last year. I've never been so excited. Imagine winning $5,000 just for writing what I honestly thought about Crisco. Why, now I can buy a car, and that means a grand vacation trip this summer. Now, maybe you'll be the one to buy a car and take a grand vacation trip this time. So listen to what you do. Write the fifth line to a jingle that's on the official entry blank. The first four lines go like this. For cakes, pies, and frying each day, most any wise housewife will say... For cakes, pies, and frying each day, most any wise housewife will say... Use Crisco, it's sure, so creamy and pure. Use Crisco, it's sure, so creamy and pure. Da-da-da, da-da-da, da dum day. <laughs> now that's where you write a last line, see? Like this, perhaps. And your meals get a hearty okay. Just remember, your last line must end in a word that rhymes with day. Oh, won't you taste the fluffy cakes, the flaky pies, or the golden brown fried foods you can make with Crisco? Say, you'll have ideas for last lines by the dozen. And send in every idea. Remember, each additional entry means another opportunity to win. And just remember, with each last line, mail your name, address, and a Crisco label, any size or facsimile. Address Vic and Sade, Cincinnati, Ohio. That's Vic and Sade, Cincinnati, Ohio. This contest is open to residents of the United States and Canada. Entries will be judged solely on originality, suitability, and aptness. Now, your Crisco dealer has official blanks that give the jingle and complete rules. If your entry is on that official blank, or if your entry is on a plain piece of paper with your dealer's signature and address, you'll double the amount of any prize you win. So get those official blanks from your dealer today. Win and double your winnings in Crisco's second big double cash contest. It's early evening as we enter the small house, halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook and their son, Mr. Rush Cook. Vic and Sade are established on opposite sides of the library table, and the former is speaking. Listen. <laughs> as long as you're convinced you're a counselor street, why bother checking back over them? Just for fun. You're always joshing me. I can't go shopping with Ruthie and not get my money mixed up. Well... This afternoon I done it, and I'm going to show you. Mm-hmm. What you pulling up a chair for? As soon as you people get through with your conversation, me and Dove are going to play rummy. Well, don't hurry us. Oh. All right, Vic. Uh-huh. This list represents everything Ruthie and me bought today. Mm-hmm. And here is 48 cents. Represents my change. Willie, you're not busy. Take your lead pencil and piece of paper and do little arithmetic for Mom. Okay. From $5, subtract 48 cents. Well, I can do that in my head. Five dollars minus forty-eight cents. Use paper and the... lead pencil. I want my results correct. Doing arithmetic in a person's head is sloppy. Run the risk of making mistakes by the bushel. Oh. Use paper and lead pencil. Oh. Now, Vic, here's what we done. Mm-hmm. Instead of me paying for this thing and Ruthie paying for that thing and the both of us paying for the other thing, don't you see? And getting all confused, don't you see? We fixed it so one person paid for everything. Uh, uh. And spent one person's money. Uh, uh. All right. Uh. $4.52. Where? <laughs> $5 minus 48 cents equals $4.52. Oh, uh-huh. Vic, that money represents how much... Oh, hey, that remainder's an awful big remainder. I'll guarantee it's correct. Well, I surely couldn't have spent that much. Oh, I see. I see. Four dollars and fifty-two cents, Vic, represents what Ruthie and me both spent. Uh-huh. 
Now, here's what we done. Mm -hmm. I left my pocketbook at home. Really? Left it right here home on the buffet. Wasn't taking the slightest chance of getting mixed up, see? We arranged it. We were going to spend Ruthie's money and only Ruthie's money. And keep strict tabs on every item purchased. Mm -hmm. See, Stu? Yeah. Ruthie had a $5 bill and she gave it to me. Why? I was to do all the buying. <laughs> you girls go about stuff the hard way. Wouldn't it be simpler just to make your own purchases with your own dough? If Ruthie wants a nickel's worth of gumdrops, let her buy a nickel's worth of gumdrops with her own nickel. Or if you want a package of hairpins, go buy your own package no, of hairpins. No, no, you're always joshing me. I can't keep my money straight. Well, this afternoon I made a special effort to keep it straight. And I did. Arranged trash so there couldn't be any mistakes. Here's Ruthie's list of what we bought, and here's my change. Mm. I just want to show you it'll come out even to the penny. Mm. You say this is your change, Ma? Yes, 48 cents. And what was that remainder again? Uh, 452. 452 represents the money spent. And this change is yours? Sure. Now, don't interrupt for a minute while I explain to you. But how did it happen you got any change? You said you used Ruthie's $5 bill. Ruthie's $5 bill? And Miss Stenbottom's $5 bill. What about Miss Stenbottom's $5 bill? Well, if it was used to buy stuff with, how come you're entitled to any change? Yeah, the man has a point there, Dr. Sleech. You didn't put out any dough. You said you left your purse at home. And I gather you made a variety of purchases. Explain how you have in your possession the sum of 48 cents. As I see Wait it, a Mr. minute now. Probably what actually happened, Mr. Wait Emma. a minute, will you? Oh. You see, your mother played hob with the economic system. <laughs> yeah. They ought to retain a scientific advisor. Some guy with long whiskers and a briefcase who'd keep the ship of finance off of the treacherous Oh, boxes. sure, Vic. Ruthie's money. Hmm. Oh, this 48 cents belongs to Ruthie. Hmm. <laughs> Darn silly girl. What'd she hand it to me for? Couldn't say. <laughs> well, sure, Ruthie's 48 cents. And the 452 represents what we both spent. Everything's itemized on that list. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. Here's how we started out. I took charge of the $5 bill. Oh, why did you do that? Because it was arranged I was to do the buying. But Ruthie had the only pocketbook. Yours was home on the buffet. On top of that was Ruthie's dough. Well, Ruthie I again, huh? Oh, I mean Miss Stembottom. Miss Stembottom was Maybe a Maybe we don't actually require you in this discussion, Sonny. <laughs> Just kind of sit quiet, and maybe after a bit, I'll have a little arithmetic for you to do. Oh. I took charge of the $5 bill. Uh-huh. Now, that was because Ruthie had other monies in her purse, and we didn't want to take the slightest chance of getting the separate monies mixed, see? Mm. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Ruthie handed me this 48 cents. Uh -huh. <laughs> she can be such a featherhead sometimes. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, Rash, while I think of it, subtract 10 cents from 5 cents. Can't be done. I mean, the other way around, of course, foolish. Subtract five cents from ten cents. Use pencil and paper? Yeah, this was a little private transaction Ruthie and I had off to one side. Got nothing to do with our actual shopping. Mm. Five cents. What? I just took paper and pencil and figured and subtracted and calculated and got the result. Five cents from ten cents leaves five cents. Smartness? No, only it's comical. Well, you may decide trash isn't so comical directly. Oh. Now, Vic, <laughs> read off that list. Mm. It'll demonstrate how everything's itemized and listed so there's no room for mistakes. Uh, hooks, knives, thread, candy, get weighed, safety pins, wash... Slow. Huh? Read it slow so I can explain. <laughs> Kiddo, if you're satisfied your accounts are straight, I'm satisfied. No, no but you're forever teasing a person. Now, what's that first item? Hooks and eyes? Yeah. Ten cent store. Ruthie wanted hooks and eyes. She bought her hooks and eyes, and I produced the $5 bill and paid for them. Hooks and eyes are marked Ruthie, aren't they? Mm, yeah. Next thing. Thread. White thread, number 50, 5 cents. Is it marked Sade? Yeah. Next thing. Candy. Little sack of chocolate drops in at the 10 cent store. It's marked Sade and Ruthie. Yes, both of us in on that deal. Sack of candy cost a nickel, two and a half cents a piece. Ish on the half cent, though. I have to bother about the half cent. Next thing is get weighed. Also in at the ten cent store. We got weighed. One cent each. Uh-huh. Next thing safety pins. A uh, Ruthie, the Hamilton's novelty counter. Next thing is wash rags. Mark Sadie. Next thing hey, is Hey, just a second. Huh? About them safety pins. Mm. Hmm. The fugally there. Hmm? 
Ruthie kept the change. Uh. She said she wanted safety pins, and I give her a quarter. Safety pins were a dime. The girl gave her back 15 cents, and she put it in her purse without thinking. Just now remembered. I was in charge of the money. I should have had that 15 cents. Mm -hmm. Sure. I should have had that 15 cents. Mm. Well, it won't interfere with the result, any. Just means I owe Ruthie 15 cents. She owes you 15 cents. Oh, sure. Oh, wait, though. This 48 cents here on the table is hers. I owe her this 48 cents. All right. Instead of giving her the whole business, I'll give her what's left from 48 cents after 15 cents has been subtracted. Uh, won't I? Yeah. Take your paper and lead pencil and see what that amounts to. Huh? Yeah, that'll straighten it out. <laughs> yeah. She put that darn change in her pocketbook like a ninny. 33 cents. <laughs> 15 from 48 is 33? Uh-huh. Fine. That's what Ruthie's got coming. Uh, next thing, Vic. I can't read the next thing. Looks like Snyder or Brider. Crider. Miss Crider. Did you purchase Miss Crider while they were downtown? We bumped into her in the underwear there in Yamilton's. Ruthie gave her some money she owed her. How much? Don't it tell on the list? Uh-uh. Sure it does. Well, look for yourself. Well, that scatterbrained Ruthie. She never wrote down what she paid Miss Crider. Don't you remember, Ma? Well, why would I remember? It's none of my beeswax. Well, you were in charge of the money. You were the one that was supposed to pay. Out the Don't money you see? When you did. What? Didn't Ruthie get the money she gave Mrs. Crider from you? No. Where did she get it then? From her pocketbook, I suppose. Why did she note the transaction down on this list then? I don't know. Huh. I don't know. Mm. Oh, stop it, you two. Stop what, Ma? Laughing. We're not laughing. You're going to in a minute, though. Look at you. All you can do to keep your faces straight. Which includes another brief interlude, the small house halfway up in the next block. And there we leave. Chris goes Vic and Sade until tomorrow. Now there's still time to get your entries in this week for Chris Goes Big Double Cash Contest. You may win the grand prize of $2,500, and there's 125 other cash prizes. So see your Crisco dealer for official blanks with complete rules and instructions on how to double any prize you win. And don't forget to listen to Crisco's Pick and Save tomorrow. This is Mel Allen speaking. Kind of crazy when they're talking about just like pennies and nickels and dimes. All of a sudden they're hawking $2,500 prizes you can double, all for answering a simple jingle. Um... And this is another one where you almost feel sorry for Sade. I mean, that th Paul Reimer could write and create such rounded characters. Uh, and just... It, it, it's a beautiful form of writing. Uh, in perhaps the tradition, as some have said, of Mark Twain. Another great American humorist, in fact. Uh, probably should examine some of his works on the other, uh, the, the big appreciation showcase, which the very newest one, number six, I have started to use public domain music again. A couple of years ago, um, they started putting audio recordings into the public domain, and uh, we are getting access to a lot of early jazz, uh, unusual music, and just music that we can use and Fairly good recordings are popping up places. I mean, yes, a lot of them are scratchy, old records. But say you use Spotify, you can find so much music from the 20s, remastered and sounding pretty good. And uh, on this uh, big appreciation showcase, I include such legends as the possible inventor of jazz, Mr. Jelly Roll Morton, uh, the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, who were key in bringing this kind of music to the public, um, all of these things. And uh, let's see, stepping back to what's going on on the onset, uh, as you stalwarts know, our uh, master, uh, the creator of the entire concept, Frank Edward Nora, Recently, uh, his father passed, 
and his father made appearances and was part of the channel in certain ways and interviewed by Frankie. I even did his own series briefly, and I really enjoyed hearing the uh, progenitor of what we have today because, hey, without Frank's father, we wouldn't have any of this. And uh, also, I mean, hearing Frank deal with this grief and all of the things that all of us have or are going to deal with. I mean, I'm somebody who has elderly parents and uh, the, the the parents of me, uh, I, who knows how long they will persist. So it's all very, it's interesting. And he's doing a series that he's entitled uh, Frank, Ralph, Nora, forever and uh interviews and podcast interviews and uh, the first episode which isn't very long is up on the on he put it up on the 13th today being the 16th when i'm recording this and it's numbered number one so uh check it out that this is uh that there's just so much and there's a fresh sermon from Dave in Kentucky. And, of course, delicious episodes of Frank Edward Nora rampling along on the overnight skate. Uh, I've got to hear the one he posted the other day completely. I'm only partially, partially the way in. He talks about seeing a, it's a nice 70 millimeter print of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was partially kind of messed with uh, on one of the big appreciation showcases where uh, I played an excerpt from the Over the Edge broadcast. Um, that's, that's the whole Hal thing and AI. Uh, again, uh, prescient stuff that we are facing today. I mean, just like you know, my favorite movie of that sort, the uh, inevitable Colossus the Forbin Project where, uh, what made in the 70s, where uh, a thinking computer pretty much takes over the world or tries its best to. Uh, I, I got some Bob and Ray here, so uh, let's check that out. We invite you to spend another educational session with the idol of the nation's youngsters, Mr. Science. As we look in on the modern, well-equipped laboratory today, we see that little Jimmy Schwab is just arriving to watch Mr. Science perform his latest fascinating experiment. Well, hello there, Jimmy. You're right on time, as usual, to watch me perform my latest fascinating experiment. I always make it a point to be punctual when I know you're going to perform a fascinating experiment, Mr. Science. What wondrous thing have you chosen for today? Well, Jimmy, today we're going to demonstrate how the rays of the sun can be utilized to start a bonfire. Leap and lizards, Mr. Science. I'll <laughs> bet we have a lot, get a lot closer to the sun to do that. How are we going to fly up there? <laughs> well, you don't have to fly up to the sun to do it, Jimmy. We... Holy mackerel, Mr. Science. You mean you're going to bring the sun down here? No, son. We're going to do it with the aid of this ordinary magnifying glass. Boy, oh boy. That's just like the magnifying glass my grandpa Schwab uses to read the newspaper. But he never started to fire with it. He lets his cigar ashes drop between the sofa cushions to do that. Well, it's necessary to capture the rays of the sun in a certain way to create fire, Jimmy. You'll learn the scientific principle from today's experiment. Now, first, you'll notice that we've brought the ingredients we need for starting our fire over here by the laboratory window. Now, that's to make the sun's rays readily available. Great suffering catfish, Mr. Science. What's that ingredient you've piled up there on the laboratory workbench? That's called straw, Jimmy. Straw? Wowie, wowie, <laughs> zingo. Wait till I tell the gang at school I've seen some of that. Yes, well, I'm sure this is opening up a whole new world for you, son. Oh, gosh, I'm awestruck with childish amazement. Well, the most exciting part is yet to come. Now, watch how I hold the magnifying glass so that it directs all the sunlight onto one small area of our straw pile. Boy, oh, boy, holding it that way, likewise, makes the straw look much larger when viewed through the glass. Well, that's true, Jimmy, but that's not the point of this particular experiment. Well, holy net, Mr. Science, I don't see any other point. The straw is just lying there looking bigger than it did before. Well, observe more closely, Jimmy. You see the smoke starting to rise from that spot where the sun's rays are concentrated? Oh, golly, two shoes. 
I sure do, Mr. Science. And now the scientific element we've learned to call fire is breaking through the smoke. Boy, oh boy, my eyes have never beheld such powerful magic. Well, it's not magic at all, Jimmy. We've simply taken the rays of the sun, which normally fall over a wide area, and directed all of their intensity into one small point. Now I'll go get some water to put out the flames before they can cause any damage to okay. my laboratory. And while you do that, I'll perform another experiment with the magnifying glass here. I want to see what happens when we direct the rays of the sun onto the stuff in this test tube. Oh, no, don't do that, Jimmy. That's a highly volatile fluid there. Put the magnifier away, son. Gee, I don't know what volatile means, no, but no. I only want to set it on fire a little to prove that... Uh... Oh. This session with Mr. Science was brought to you as a public service, paid for by the Philanthropic Council to Make Things Nicer. Today's broadcast was the last in our current series. Yodio Committee to Make Things Nicer. We, we, we should all. I, I, I mean, I wish I had that um, in me. I, I, I work on it, but I, I'm still I'm unable to make things as nice as... I feel I should be able to. There's just something, something yet that I need to achieve. But we're, we're getting there. We are getting there. And um, our time is up. And uh, you got to love Bob and Ray and, and Mr. Science, Dr. Science. Oh, these shows are just too much fun. And there's more to come. And uh, the uh, giant appreciation showcases and... Yeah, and an overnight scape central on fear, forthcoming in your future or perhaps in your past, but they're all on the big on sug at onsug.com. Until we meet again, set the controls for the heart of the fun. <laughs>